It's so good to see you today. If it's your first time here, my name is Dan Grittner, and on behalf of my beautiful wife, Joanna, we welcome you. My wife is in the back with our kids, uh, serving our kids and, and uh, raising them up along with the team, and uh, it's just a blessing to be here. I want to just honor our team of volunteers. It takes a lot of work to uh, turn a school uh, into a sanctuary. You are sitting in a sanctuary right now. Come on, somebody. And of course, we have the foyer in the back. We have some donuts and desserts uh, for after service just to connect with you. But we just love being here. You know that? We love to be here. We don't have to be here. We get to be here. And we're thankful to be here with each one of you. And so uh, we've got a birthday in the house. I got to shout her out. She doesn't want it, but I'm going to tell her. Alexa, rave to us. Alexa, give it up for her. It's her birthday today. Her and her family are in the house of God with their two beautiful children. Um, I want to get into the word, but I just want to just tell you that I love you. That I'm excited to be here with you. And I know you guys are excited to be here together with each other. We're, We're pumped because this Friday and Saturday we're going on an encounter, which is a spiritual retreat. It's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. Um, If you're saying, wow, what is that? I I didn't know about that. We'll be having one next year. We're looking at doing them once a year uh, in the springtime. And so if you didn't get in it on this time, no problem, because we're looking to doing them again. But there are spiritual retreats, kind of jumpstart our discipleship process and just our journey with God in an intentional way. So those of you who are going, man, we're excited about it. We believe it's going to be a great, great, great time for you. Now, let's get into the Word. As you know, we're journeying along through Colossians. Colossians is a New Testament letter in the Bible that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of people who lived in a city called Colossae. And we believe that this ancient letter that was written to this ancient people has application for our life today in Palm Beach County in the 21st century. They didn't deal with TikTok and and Twitter and and everything else going on in the world, but whatever they were dealing with, we do believe by God's providence and God's grace and understanding, it affects us today. So we're excited about the Word of God and to go with it. I'm reading from Colossians 1, verses 24 through 29, and we're just marching along through these sections Uh, Follow along with me. Some of you have your actual hand Bible with you, and I think that's amazing. Some of you may have brought a notepad for notes, um, but it's going to be on the screen for you if you need it. Colossians 1, 24 through 29. Let's go to the Word of God. It says this. Paul's writing here. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of His body which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but has now been revealed to His saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches. Someone say riches. What are the riches of the glory of of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I love these last two verses. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And Paul said, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Now, Paul, okay, I want you to understand kind of the history of it and what's going on here. The Apostle Paul spent five years of his lifetime in either prison or on house arrest, all right? Five years. If he was walking around, he'd have like the little ankle bracelet for like a while. And in, during those five years, they equ- equated to three different imprisonments. So three different times he was jailed. And all those three times together added to um, five years total. Now, the first time he was in jail, you might remember the story, he was only in there for about a day. Him and Silas were preaching the gospel. They got imprisoned. And you remember they were in the jail and they started singing praises to God. And the earthquake hit and they got out of jail like in one day. 
And the second time he was in jail was this actual time he was in Rome. He was imprisoned for two years. That's when he wrote Colossians in his second imprisonment. And I want to show you some pictures so you can kind of get an idea. This is not the pal. This is not uh, the jail. This is the palace where the emperor lived, and the jail was underneath, um, underneath that building. This is a picture of the actual cells. They did not have individual cells, but they had like group cells, and they would be chained up against these walls, and they'd be chained up in there. That's why Paul says, oftentimes he says, I'm a slave of Christ. He, he talked about his chains, and he talked about the, the shame of his chains. Paul understood isolation and shame. He had to battle through that. And uh, so he felt that there. Of course, they weren't, <laughs> they weren't blessing him too well, so he must have felt you know, low and, and dirty and, and isolated. But in that space, he wrote Colossians. So when he says, um, I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, I rejoice in my sufferings for you. How many of you know you've got to be a mature person to rejoice in your sufferings for other people? Oh, Lord, every parent, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> right? Isn't that a mature? I rejoice in my sufferings for you. Now, obviously, if Paul is rejoicing now, he's in jail and he's excited about it. He's rejoicing in it for the sufferings for, for the people in the church. He must have believed... Whatever was happening in the people was worthy of his imprisonment, right? It's hard for me to suffer and find joy when I'm struggling for myself, let alone if someone else is, I'm suffering for somebody else and I'm having joy for that, right? I don't like suffering. I don't know. I'm sorry I'm your pastor. I don't like suffering. How about you? I don't like it at all. But Paul found a place where he could be joyful in his sufferings for the people. Now, obviously, what's going on in the people must have been significant and powerful and mighty. Now, what was happening in the people that would give Paul joy to suffer? Well, we see it in our text here. A couple things he tells them. He says, I'm, 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 I'm excited about the suffering because the riches of the mystery of the gospel are being formed in your life. The, we have to understand this, that as the people of God, when we put our faith in Christ, that there are riches that we can attain to. Not necessarily earthly riches, although we believe in, 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 in operating our finances well. We believe there's a blessing on our life as we honor God with our finances. We believe in prosperity. Yes, we do. But the riches that he's talking about are riches eternally. There are eternal riches available for you. It is actually your inheritance to receive as a child of God. You have an inheritance from your Father in heaven. And he has a lot of riches in heaven. We say, what are some of those riches? Well, joy is a rich in, in, in the gospel. Peace. Vision for our lives. Not walking around in darkness, but walking in the light. These are all heavenly riches that are available for you and I. This is actually our inheritance, our right. Imagine if your, your parents died and you knew that there was an inheritance for you to receive. And so your parents passed away and so of course you're, you're devastated by that, but you go in and, and you say, well, I'd like to see the will. And the lawyer gives you the will. And you see what you're, you're, you see that you're able to get X amount of, let's say, call it $100,000 is coming to you. And imagine if the lawyer said, well, the will says that you're allowed to get $100,000. And these were your biological parents. And so that is rightfully yours. But imagine if the lawyer said, I just don't feel like releasing it today. You're not getting that money. Now, you act all saved and dignified in the house of God today. But I bet money you'd have some choice words and some choice actions for that lawyer, right? Because that's rightfully yours. Nobody can take it from you. These same riches in heaven is the same way. 
Don't let anybody or anything take the riches away from you. Right? How many of you know it can be easy to let people or situations or circumstances rob us of our joy? It can be easy to let circumstances and people rob us of our peace. Right? These are riches for you. Now, now Paul goes on to explain some of this. He says, now this, these riches, this glory, this mystery is actually Christ in you. That's actually the riches. It's not something far out there. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ. Now, I love this book. It's part of the reasons why we wanted to preach it. Colossians, rethink the gospel. Because I want us to understand what is the gospel. The gospel is simply this. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And if I have faith in that, Christ also resurrects me. That's the gospel. It's, too, it's so simple, I wish sometimes it was more spectacular than that, but that's actually pretty spectacular. And they've been preaching it for thousands of years, so I think we should just continue it, right? The death, burial, and resurrection, I believe in that. Christ, I receive you. Boom, I am now resurrected. Because remember the two things that Paul was coming against. He was coming against that young church in Colossae. He was coming against Judaism. Judaism is a religion that says you have to wash your hands before you eat. You have to do such and such. You have all these rituals to get to God. And then they had this other thing going on in that culture called Gnosticism, which was this spiritual thing, which was like kind of this like horoscope thing. Jesus is not really God, but he was better than man. He's kind of in, he's kind of suspended in between. And you kind of just think of horoscopes or like some lady with dreads on the beach, you know, doing something crazy on the beach, right? This spirituality thing. Paul's coming to them. He says, look, it's not about your works. You can never be good enough to get to God. And it's not some buffet of spirituality. It's Christ. It's not you. It's not, it's not reliant on you. And it's not relying on something out there. It's actually reliant on Christ in you, the hope of glory. I like that old hymn. From Christ the solid rock I stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust in the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils His lovely face, I'll rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and every stormy day, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, His covenant, His blood. Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, then all is my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So Christ is your rock today. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening in your family, your finances, your situation today. But I believe the Holy Spirit is is coming alongside you today to lift your head up and see Him and see Him working in your life. How many of you know it's good if he works in someone else's life, but it's better when he works in my life? Now, I like this last part. I love this. It's so bold. Uh, Colossians 1.28, when Paul says, him we preach. I I just love that personally. Him we preach. We're here to preach Christ, aren't we, Danielle? No, we're not here to preach our opinion. If you're looking for a good church, there's many good churches in our county and if you're here at LifeSpring today, we'd love to have you. But if you should, this should be your last time at LifeSpring. And you need to find a church. You better find a church that preaches Jesus. Wherever you go, anywhere in the world. Because we're here to preach Christ. So Paul says, Him we preach. And then he says this thing. He goes, we're warning and we're teaching every man. We're warning men and we're teaching, man. Those two words together come, come the word admonish. We're, ad, we're admonishing men. This is the heart of the ministry of Jesus Christ. We are to admonish one another 
okay? It's not just the preacher's job to admonish. As brothers and sisters, we should admonish each other. We should warn one another. You know a friend that's on Tinder, you better warn him. Mm -hmm. I'm just playing with you, right? We have to warn one another. It, it, admonishing, a great example I think of this is, um, is if you have teenagers, if you have teenagers, you're probably in a season of admonishment. You're warning them, watch out for that party, watch out for that friend, watch out for that uh, stop sign, watch out for that red light. I mean, you're just all the time warning them. Now, your warning for your teenager is not to take anything away from them. You want them to have fun. You want them to enjoy their childhood. Now, they might think you're, you know, you're an old fuddy-duddy, and they might think something. But your, your warning for your teenager is strictly and solely out of love. You're admonishing them. You're lifting them up. Well, the church of Jesus Christ is to admonish the people. We are to warn the people. We are to teach the people that what? That they might grow and be in God. Now, Paul was a great admonisher. He was a great teacher. We see this in uh, the Ephesians when he was with the Ephesus. He went to many cities. When he went to Ephesus, he was there with them for three years and he cried out for them. Let me show you this in Acts chapter 20. This is when he's leaving the city of Ephesus on to another place. He gathered up the elders and he spoke these words to them. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out! Remember the three years I was with you, he said. My constant Watch and care over you night and day with many tears for you. See, this is the heart of the ministry. This is the heart of God. This is what churches are trying to do on Sundays and in, in and out of their meetings. They're trying to watch out. We're trying to warn the people because we are truly like sheep. And Isaiah says we're like sheep that have gone away and and, and, I'm, and I'm a sheep as well. And it's funny that God would liken us to sheep. I'll, I'll just say this. It's funny that God would liken me to a sheep because sheep are really dumb. Notice I said me. Because I love you. Sheep are really dumb, but God says I'm like a sheep. And, 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 and I need to study up on sheep. I think that I've heard that they don't see too well and they need to be poked. And this is a sheep, you know, they need to be poked and they need to be prodded. But God calls us like sheep. That's why we need a shepherd. This is why we need a shepherd. This is why we need a guide. All of us need a guide. Someone who's helping us in the scriptures. He goes on again, Paul does. When he writes Corinthians, he writes that first letter and he had to adjust a lot of things in the church of Corinth. Corinth was a powerful church. They were very gifted. They were very skilled, the people of Corinth. They were very talented. That's where we get the spiritual gifts. Um, and so he had to just adjust a lot of things for them. But he says this in Corinthians 4.14. Paul told them, he goes, I'm not writing these things to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. So anytime there's a correction, you know, this is why we love the Word of God, because the Word of God can strengthen us. The Word of God equips us. The Word of God warns us. Right? So we love the Word of God because we know it's there for our good and our guide. Let me give you one more thing on this. I know I'm talking a lot about it, but I want to talk lastly right here, the Greek definition of teaching and warning. It says this, to properly uh, to place the mind. It's i.e. reasoning with someone by warning them. It is admonishing them. The Greek word there is 3560 in the Greek dictionary. It means to admonish through instruction especially appeals to the mind, supplying doctrinal and spiritual substance or content. This even exerts positive pressure on someone's logic or reasoning, 
i.e. urging them to choose to turn to God's best. So I want to talk to you. So the Word of God in every area of our life is there to guide us in every area. You say, what do you mean every area? Can we, can we preach real where you were at today? How many of you know the Bible has some language and some direction how we should operate sexually? It's in there, right in there. How we should operate sexually, our, our lustful pleasures, our sexual appetites, it's all in the Bible. It's, it's, it's not there to hinder us. It's not there to not let us move ahead. It's there to actually warn us and actually guide us onto a better way. I know the culture has a way, but God has a better way, right? Finances, it teaches us how to manage our finances. A lot of times we, we, people will go to the tithe, which is the first 10%, but it also talks how to manage yourself not getting into debt, not slamming yourself with a yoke of bondage and debt. So practical, the Word of God. It tells us how we should operate as children, how we should manage our, our, our parents, even when they're older. I mean, every area of our life, the Word of God is there. There is an answer for every situation that you need in life. God has an answer for you, and it's found in the Word of God, the teaching through the Word of God, and it's found in Jesus and in the gospel. And so he goes on there in the, in the text there, he goes, his, his purpose, the ministry's purpose, our purpose is to present people perfect. We want to present people perfect to Jesus. It'd be like if I wanted to, to, to shout one of you out and I said, hey, someone, you come up here and, and, I, and I want to present you. And I would say your name and maybe what you did for work or or who you are, maybe I know you, and I brought you right here, and, and I presented you before the people. I'd be presenting you. I'd be, you'd see the whole person. You would know this person after I present them to you, right? And you would know about them, what they do for work, and their name. This is what we are trying to do with you before Christ. That's what Paul said. We are trying to present people before Christ perfect. We're trying to say, this person came into the sheepfold, and they started getting equipped, and, and their resentment started going away, and their fear started going away, and their mind began to be renewed, and they began to grow as a disciple. Not only that, God, but they began to pour back into other people. They began to do what you said in Matthew 28, 19, to go and make disciples. Not are they being formed, but they're also, they're showing the love of Christ on their job. They're sharing their testimony. They're praying with people at Starbucks. They're delivering demons out of people from Walmart. <laughs> it's a powerful person, God. Look, we're presenting them to you. That's the purpose of that's the purpose of the ministry. That's why we're here to be presented perfect unto Christ. Now, when he says to be presented perfect, what he means is to be able to discern spiritual things. That's what he means. To discern spiritual things. You know, you can discern spiritual things. I'll tell you one way that happens is by praying in the Spirit. Praying in tongues. At the encounter, we're going to talk more about that. Some of you might not even understand what I'm talking about, but if you need some explanation, come talk to us. We'll ex describe it. Some of you pray in tongues. Some of you pray in the Spirit. Maybe it's been a long time since you prayed in the Spirit. But this is a way that you can discern. Two things you wait to discern, you, read, you get into the Bible and you pray. That's how you grow as discerning spiritual things. And this is the mission of our life. You know, the, the, the banners, I don't know if we have it so much here, but when we opened up at Royal Palm Beach Elementary School, we had um, a set of banners the first time we launched in Royal Palm. And a lot of those banners, these, some of these banners are different, but a lot of those banners, they said, discover your purpose. That many of you remember that, discover your purpose, because we want people to walk in their purpose. Mike, you could come and play for us, Michael. So I'll just tell you, for me, there was a time in my life when I didn't know what to do with my life. You ever been there? Some of you are like, I'm in that right now, right? It's a tough place to be when you don't know what to do. And I would remember shouting out to God, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Just tell me. And, and for some reason, I went years and he wasn't telling me. 
One aspect for me was, I don't know why I got this in my head. When I graduated high school, I graduated high school a little bit late because my mom is like such a nurturer. She held me back in first grade. Hold back my little boy, you know. So I graduated a little bit later. Um, and then I, when I was going into college, I was going to PBSC. And I said, well, I'm going to get a degree. I knew I wanted a piece of paper. And I didn't know what to do. And I don't know why it was in my mind. I was like, at 19, I was like, whatever I pick, you know, I got to be that forever. You know what I'm saying? Now people get degrees and we, and we don't work in our field that we, but for me, I was like, oh my God, I, like 19, I have my whole life right here is whatever degree I pick. And I ended up picking music education because I play the saxophone and, and I, I guess what I'm, what I'm going to do, you know? So I picked that, but I was just so lost and and I didn't know what my purpose was because I knew inside my purpose was not to play the saxophone as you can see right now. But, but, but I was so lost and I said, God, I need to know my purpose. And many of you know my story. I went to Venezuela and God radically changed my life on that trip to Venezuela. When I came back, I was, I'm telling you, a whole different person. I was involved in stuff I shouldn't have been involved with. When I got back in U.S. soil, I never got involved with that at all. It was a radical shift. I had discovered my purpose. I understood my purpose was to live for God and be involved in the church. That's just all I could articulate at 19. But that's what I did because I had discovered my purpose. And so when we started in Royal Palm, I said, I want people to discover their purpose. But now as we've launched that church in Royal Palm, and now we're launching out again here again. I've learned something in, in two years. I've learned something. I've developed. I've grown in two years. And yes, I want you to know your specific purpose. If you're supposed to be a nurse, if you're supposed to be a business person, whatever it is, I know that God wants you to know those specific things, right? But sometimes I think we get too caught up on the specifics and sometimes we miss the generalities. You know what is the purpose of God for you? I'll tell you. It's to live holy. It's to love God and love people. Right? This is the purpose of God for you and for me. To, to be a friend to the friendless. To bring hope to the hopeless. To shine a light in your neighborhood. To bring the gospel to wherever it is that you go. This is your purpose in life. To be a child of God. And to walk with God. And to usher that in wherever you go. This is your purpose. So what can we take from this message today? We have riches from our Father. And that is available to you because it's Christ in you. Therefore, it's Him we preach wherever we go because this is our purpose. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Let me pray for you today. Bow your heads with me, Lord. I thank you for each person in this place today. Lord, I thank you for blessing each person, oh God. I thank you that they're growing in God, I pray. Oh God, I just declare that they're growing in God in ways that they never even imagined. We just thank you today that they are growing in God. And Lord, I pray that each person in this place today would know and feel the love of God that you have for them. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, from the love of Christ. With every head bowed, I want to just ask you, if you're in here today and you say, Dan, today I feel like I'm getting closer to Jesus. And I want more of Jesus in my life. Would you just raise your hands? You say, I just acknowledge that I want more of Christ in my life. Awesome. 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 I love to do that. You can put your hands down. I love to do that because it gives us an action. It's not really about you raising your hand, but it's something that's happening in your heart that is causing you to respond. Lord, we thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for every heart that was raised. That you would lead, guide, and direct us like sheep. May we walk on the path that you have for us more and more. And we thank you, oh God, for your love and your power and your strength that's coming to each heart today. 
Lord, whatever anybody's in here believing for, whatever anybody needs, Lord, we just release them now to receive those things. In Jesus' name, amen.